Great. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm sure most of you know me. My, I'm Chris Johnson. I'm a professor here at CCA in the photo program. And welcome to the first of our 2023 BFA Senior Thesis Conversations in Photography. And before we begin, I'd like to share our land acknowledgement. Um, the California College of the Arts campuses are located in Weichan and Yalamo, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories on the Chinchenyo and Remotish Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived on this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted on indigenous people in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. If you're unsure of the land whose land you're currently residing, we encourage you to visit land hyphen, I'm sorry, native land.ca. So, as most of you know, these BFA conversation events have become a tradition of all programs of our school pretty much. Um, what you may not know is that the concept and format of these conversations for our graduating seniors began during the pandemic when our own professor Nelson Chan, who was here with us, was looking for a way to not only share and celebrate the great work of our students, but also to provide a fresh perspective on what we are doing by a respected outside voice. And it's in that regard that I'm very pleased to say that this has given me the opportunity to invite my dear friend, Susan Felter, to join <laughs> us. Um, if you don't know Susan, Susan is an artist who grew up in Oakland, receiving a BA in psychology and art from UC Berkeley and an MFA in motion pictures from UCLA. Her film, Pescados Vivos, won film festival awards in the 1970. Then in 1980, she received a Guggenheim Fellowship for her photographic project, Rodeo Work. I think that's when we met, Susan, around some work. Yeah, around. probably. After her next series, Circus Work, in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1985, she discovered computers. Her first digital series, The Ancestors, was followed by Hunting and Gathering and Surfaces, and now Digital Thicket. Her photographic work has been exhibited and published in the United States and abroad, and she taught photography at Santa Clara University from 1983 to 2010. So she's very experienced and uh, it's gonna be wonderful to hear your comment on our work. Well, if I'm not too old and dingy at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I'd also like to thank our program managers, Ingrid Wells and Michaela Chan Sanchez. Michaela is here with us. And of course, our program chair, Aspen Mays. So the way these programs work is that each senior will be given a 10 minute presentation on their work. And then we'll have 10 minutes for Susan to offer questions and comments, and really just to have a short conversation with our students. Please note that we won't have time for a public Q&A, but we invite those of you who are here to drop off affirmations and questions in the Zoom chat, where they'll be shared and uh, passed on to our presenters as a kind of virtual guest book. These conversations are being recorded and will be available for viewing on the CCA portal website. And of course, I'm sure you all know, keep your microphones muted during the presentations so to, to avoid overlapping voices. So our agenda today is going to begin with Hong Min Jin and then Lin Ma, Lina Ma, um, Ziha Xiao, and Valencia um, Malfalcone, Monte Falcone. Um, after the presentations, um, Nelson will offer some closing remarks and a preview on the conversations coming up next week. So um, if there aren't any questions, without further ado, our first presentation will be Han Min Jin. Hi, Espen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Great to see you all. Looking forward to it. Can you guys see the screen? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay, start. Hi, my name is Hong Min Jing. I pronounce by she, her. I'm from Shanghai, China. 
I really love travel, playing games, finding different kinds of food, and animation. I focus on portrait photography. I'm a huge fan of fairy tale fantasy story person. I started watching Japanese animation and the Disney movie when I was a kid. I was very really deeply in a fairy tale fantasy world in my own mind. In this case, I love different kinds of costume to cosplay the character I love. It's which the picture on the uh, left. I also love Lolita fashion because they are really beautiful and just like the clothes worn by people in the cartoons, which picture on the right, which now, uh, even now, very tough fantasy is still affect me. Uh, Chen Man is my uh, early influence person. Chen Man is a visual artist, creative medium, including photography, graphic design, and digital art. Chen Man also makes cover for fashion magazines and uh, cooperates with many brands and artists around the world. I really love her uh, creations. She can make different elements and create a unique, uh, bizarre world. When I saw her photos, I remembered when I used to play the cosplay. I also want to, at that time, I also want to take these kind of pictures. In Shanghai, there are a lot, a lot of interactive exhibitions, letting, to, letting people to take pictures in there. I took these pictures during high school. At that time, I felt every picture I took really like a magazine photo. I really love them, but after I got into the college, I realized these pictures are not belongs to me. These beautiful pictures are big specific on the setting in the exhibition and they only can be used for daily sharing, not, uh, not my own work. So next few slides, I will show my own fairy tale theme work. They have no special meaning. I just like the uh, what they look like. The lighting is good, the composition is good, and the model looks very beautiful. For this side, um, I asked model to wear hanfu, which is traditional Chinese clothing. A model acting in a sense of girl traveling in a ancient China. The second and the third slides are taken from uh, are taken from, uh, basically from my dream I had myself. In the dream, I woke up in well, I woke up from the stage. I wore a very gorgeous related really dresses and found out I well I was in a garden. And I was exploring in the garden and suddenly I find a camera. In the camera, I find another world. Snow White and Cinderella appear in my dream because they have like similar experience. They played uh, and talked together. But in the dream, Snow White talked about an apple and, um, uh, and asked Cinderella to eat it. And finally, Cinderella died. These works are all basic on my imagination of the uh, fantasy world. But during the pandemic, uh, when I was taking the online classes, I, I want to try like, new things. I want to try new style and get out of my comfort zone. But I was really struggling to find my new style. And then at that time, I called them to like, take any picture I like. So I was really anxiety. It's, this anxiety is almost like through about one and a half years. So I shift my idea to my own problem, body shaming. In the first attempt, I called the volunteers to ask them to choose their favorite and least favorite part. And let the audience guess which is which. If the audience think that the volunteers' least favorite part is their favorite part, which means this is not a big deal. I hope this uh, use this way to let people be confident. But the result is that the picture I took really like the picture from the medical textbook, which make people feel really bad. I start I start to think about how I present how I to present the uh, body shaming. And I start to think about fashion photo photography I talked before. Uh, 
I suddenly realized that I actually put myself into the model during I shot in during the shooting pro process because I my figure can't fit the dress I love. The dress I love doesn't have my size. In this case, my heart is telling me I still want to have a skinny body. That way I can fit the dress. Realizing this, I decide to put myself in, into the work to face myself. This work is called um, perplexed. My work is showing my anxiety on my body shaming. I want to tell people who have same problem as me, uh, whatever what you look like, this is who you are. If you want to change, don't give up. Keep on changing to be who you want to be. This, uh, this project is have two parts. The first part is shows my body looks like. You can see my body has a lot of scratch mark, a lot of layers, and the big belly. When I took these pictures, I honestly, I still, I hate it. I don't like it. And it's it's unhealthy. And then it's have um and then it don't it then it doesn't look good for me just for me and then uh in the in a sense this mannequin um I use the mannequin because the mannequin is kind of like the oh sorry uh this mannequin is people's standard body and people prefer the standard body of mannequins to my body shape I feel like mannequin is most people's aesthetic. I hope they can accept my body shape and then let me to wear the dress I love. I use mannequin to hold myself. I just, I, I hope, so this way it's kind of like, I hope they can accept me, my body, body. And the picture on the left, yeah, the picture on the left, I used the, my head to cover the mannequin's head. It's kind of like I want to inst install instead of the mannequin's body shape i want to be the, I, I won't have that and the picture on the right is kind of like um just the they hold me they accept me i hope they can accept me but finally we're, we're still different we have we still have different yeah so I um I use a lot of time to decide to put this picture in this work because this is only one picture. I straight to, to the camera. I, I use my face just straight to see the camera. You can see previous work are like I'm you can uh, I'm still like hiding behind the camera, but this this one is straight to the camera because for now I'm kind of uh recon uh reconciled with my body because this is who I am. So this work is kind of a process to hearing myself. So, yeah. So my future plan is in the fall 2023, I will study in global marketing management in Boston University because I hope I have my own photography studio in the future and then I will explore new project in the future. Yeah, so that's it. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That was really great. Um, so now, Susan Filter would get a chance to talk to Hangmin and ask her a few questions. I mean, just begin having a conversation. Uh, you are mute. Uh, now I'm okay. Got it. Now you can hear me. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was amazing. I have to say, first of all, um, I had a little trouble hearing every word that you said, and so I think I'd like to read uh -huh. the transcript at some point, but I won't do that right now. But uh -huh. um, golly. What a difference, what a surprising shift from, I like the phrase you used, something about making a world with photography. 
in your in your fantasy series. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a term you used? I thought I was very struck by that. Yes, yes, yeah, a nice yes. term. It's very, and um, and I could certainly see your potential uh, marketing chops. You know, your marketing um, sense of style and composition and movement and story um as well as excellent photography technically um and the costumes and the backgrounds i was wondering how you got that deer in there <laughs> um but uh you don't have to tell me your secrets okay, um, okay. uh so i could see i could see that as a future marketing person uh, in that world um or in hollywood for that matter uh, any we have so many places where we as cultures in the world um portray or want to portray ourselves kind of like you said the world of, that you have created in photography we certainly have those kinds of wishes i think most of us which is why photographs like these fantasy ones that you've created are so appealing because we all kind of you know have have a an emotional desire for that kind of perfection in life or what we have come to think of as perfect and then your second group oh my goodness uh <laughs> perplexed that's that's a good term i think for this series um the pictures of yourself and yourself with the mannequin are just stunningly um, sensitive and elegant, as well as sort of, um, uh, oh, what's the right word? Uh, stirring and, and it reminds me of all the imperfections I see in my own body and how many imperfections we have. And yet you've turned some of your, uh, as you say, non-standard body into the most elegant, uh, tonally rich, beautiful compositions of curves and reminds me of some of the sand dunes and other beautiful, images that people have made over the sent over the decades uh just a beautiful um lighting and uh, compositions and parts of your body um and yet also at the same time the um the somewhat emotional even to the point of agonizing, um, maybe that's too strong a word, but the the difficulty that we we have in in accepting our own selves. But you've made these beautiful pictures of yourself. You know, it reminded me a little bit of a famous life a nude drawing class model, Katie, and I'm gonna maybe not remember her last night, but she was part of the models guild uh decades ago and she was very heavy and she was so popular by from the artists they loved drawing her curves and uh she was a, a real queen among the, the the models guild my mother was a painter and so she often and taught art and life drawing and Katie was always a favorite. So I think this is quite a rich uh, um, diptych, maybe, or you have two, two chapters here and two sides of yourself, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. Look how elegant that is. Look at the lighting on that, a little delicate fill in and the shadows. Uh, it, it's just very smooth, and I admire you for um, tackling this personal 
exploration. They're very okay. beautiful. Thank you. We have a couple more minutes for any comments. Um, Chris, do you are you gonna? Is there? Do we have other <laughs> um, <laughs> teachers here? Hanmin has been listening to me talk all semester. <laughs> so, I've, I've, I've learned something. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. But this is a chance for others. I see. Um, I I'd love to jump in if I might. Um, Susan, also, it's such a pleasure to have you here with our students. Thank you so much for your insight. In your feedback. Um, yeah. Hong Min, I'm so proud of you. This is amazing to see where you took it after last semester. And you know, I was really struck when you were talking about your whole, whole process here and the kind of work that you were making and what you were interested in in fantasy. And um, to, to I think you spent the, the end of your time at CCA trying to see what was on the other side of that, you know, to try to understand why you were so attracted to that in the first place and to understand that there's another side to this that was deeply personal and really about your own feelings about your body and how you present in the world. And I think it's just really hard to do that. And I wanna really commend you for being that brave and vulnerable. And I love seeing where you took it with, with the mannequin. I just feel like that embrace with where you're, yeah, that one, it's just like, kind of a really heartbreaking image. It feels like a kind of cyborg future and it's tender, but it's also kind of upsetting. I just, I, I think where you where you were in the fall when we were working together and then where you took this is it's, it's really strong. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of you. What are the scale of these pictures? I haven't seen them in person. And like, how big are these? How are you thinking about that? Um, 18 by 20. 20, I think. Yeah, so kind of a, a more intimate scale, not not super. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I don't have enough space. So if I have enough space, I will paint bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well done. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> that was a wonderful hug, man. Mm -hmm. OK. So again, there are some comments in the chat and the chat is always gonna be available for, um, for people to use as a resource. Um, okay, so next up is Lina Ma. <laughs> Hello everyone, let me share my screen. Could you guys see it? Okay. Yes, you're good. Okay. So, hi, 大家好,我的名字叫马 Lina. It means, hi everyone, my name is Lina Ma. I use Chinese to get started because this is my first language and I want to make audience feel where I come from. And my major is photography. I prefer go by she, her, and a member of the Hui ethnic group from Yinchuan in China. I moved to the United States when I was 14, and now I live in San Francisco. In art, I tend to explore documentary and uh, abstract conceptual, and to continuously explore the field of art creation by company photography with other media. Uh, in the process of creating art, most of my inspiration comes from my personal real life experience, such as uh, real events as a Chinese ethnic minority, as well as the cultural differences I felt when immigrating to the United States. In this constant contrast of multicultures, Art, artwork of photography is like a mirror. I can through it to see myself. So I'm trying to find who I am and try to dig deeper in art, reflect myself into my works to see my own growth and changes. And explore the mutual deep relationship between this personal experience and the contemporary society. Okay. 
One of the photographers who has had a significant influence on my understanding of spirit of photography is Lü Nan. He spent 15 years living with and documenting the lives of the subjects in his artworks, expressing tr their true emotions and living conditions, and reflecting the issue and the current state of contemporary society through his artworks. For example, in the particular piece called The Forgotten People, the state of Chinese psyche Patrick words, Lunan not only lived with the mentally ill patients to record their true lives, but also implied the intimate connection between them and their families. Uh, Lunan's words made me realize the importance of the relationship between the photographer and the subject, and made me pay more attention to the people and the objects that appear in my own works. Uh, these realizations have enabled me to reflect on my own works more deeply, and I will consider the relationship and the intentions of each subject so that the audience can look beyond my pictures. On the other hand, Daido Moriyama, a photographer whose unique style and techniques have greatly influenced me, uses black and white photos with rough and high contrast green, blur and camera shake to capture images. In his book, Bye Bye Photography, I realized that he used this style to express emotions and meanings that are not necessarily visible to the naked eyes, but strongly filled with himself. He invites viewers to experience and uh, understand these emotions and ideas through his images. Moriyama taught me that expressing emotions and ideas should be the core and the theme of my photography, and that diverse and special method can be used to create photos. This, photos, this process has led me to reflect on the nature of photography itself. So one of my artwork I want to introduce is Dao Things of Belonging. It is talking about when I was 14 years old, I moved from China to the United States. I saw there are a lot of cultural differences and I could not really get into this environment. Until 19 years old, I came to the San Francisco and there is the oldest Chinese community in the US. Eight years later, uh, I'm now still searching for things of belonging, so I shoot many pictures and try to adapt into this environment. However, I saw a lot of unfamiliar elements in these photos, so this gave me an uncanny sense of belonging. Then I used digital editing to change these unfamiliar elements to my familiar elements. I project my personal emotion to the public space and I try to create my own sense of belonging. After I show my Chinese American friends, they said my picture gives them an unsettling feeling. So I intend to use this outer detail to challenge the viewer's stereotype about the Chinese community in San Francisco while also creating an unsettling feeling. For example, in this one, I changed the piece of paper in the fortune cookie to the coins we put in dumpling during Chinese New Year. I also explain the details of each photo modification and mark them below the corresponding photos. I change almost traditional Chinese and English to simplify Chinese and Chinese pinyin for all picture. And you can see the, in the right side, I change the English to the simplified Chinese and the English change to Chinese pinyin and the traditional change to the simplified Chinese. I also did some special changes, for example, in the middle one, the white aesthetical couplet change to the right. And in the left side, I add four CCTV cameras. Yeah. <laughs> and in Left side, this picture, I changed Guan Yu to the fortune cat. And uh, in the right side, I changed the pattern of the box, which is tower to great war, and also uh, English to the simplified Chinese. In this picture, uh, I changed the building's color from yellow to green. And I also changed many other details in these pictures. Yeah. This artwork has been shown in the group exhibition in San Francisco 2022, and the exhibition name is Depths of Fuse. 
So the next artwork, it is about my past experience. This is talking about traditional education in China would only emphasize the differences between men and women and would not emphasize the framework or boundaries among the same sex. It is because of this lack of emphasis on individual human rights that there ne has never been a definition of what sexual assault is between people of the same sex. So this bird boundary created a lot of unconscious and conscious sexual assault and uh, created a lot of problems. When I look at back my childhood now, I realized that it was a form of a sexual assault. I want to explore the question that when a person is unaware that he or she is being violated, that he or she still suffers the same harm, while they experience the same psychological trauma, does the trauma suffer to diminish at a later stage when one becomes aware of such problems? What is differences? In my work, I seek to answer these questions at the same time, I want to ring the alarm for the viewers. These pictures are designed to make them feel uncomfortable, but this uncomfortable feeling could encourage them to re-evaluate sexual assault carefully. I try to use multi materials to express my ideas and questions, and I want to find myself in this dark experience. And I didn't give a title for this project at this time because it's hard to face my past memory, but maybe I will continue to explore the concept in my future. This is my thesis work. I decided to explore new direction for my own experience deeply because just recently I was diagnosed with a new type of pneumonia flu. At the same time, year of lacking health habits also burst into a disastrous payback in the same time. I felt vividly that the pain of illness was torturing me constantly. When faced with something irresistible, our body will instinctively make repetitive uh, actions and the persistence of insisting on self-awareness. So I recreate this experience by manipulating and damaging the film before I make these prints. And this all my self-portrait, whenever my body my body suddenly suffers from uncontrollable physical pain. All I can do is to call out to myself repeatedly, comfort myself, and insist on waiting for my body to slowly stop and for the pain to go away. This process is the aftermath of my illness, and it plays repeatedly in my body, in my mind, and in my eyes. I try to recall the interaction between mind and body and to capture these moments in my life when physical pain is present. I also try to explore the controllable and the uncontrollable factors from them. I use film to record the moments I felt and then manually modify the body of the film. By, use, by using artificial controllable factor to destroy and manipulate the photos, I intend to emphasize that I am uncontrollable in the photos. This process creates a review of my illness and the fragments of the remaining illness. I call this project feeling because when I felt the physical pain is present, it gives me the, the feeling that will be empty and uncontrollable. So I would call out to myself repeatedly and comfort myself. So I think this process really like uh, feeling my mind and my body.
So after graduating from CCA, I plan to pursue a master's degree as a Royal College of Art to continue my exploration of my past work. I would also like to learn a boundary knowledge of photography and the interdisciplinary approaches in a new environment. Secondly, in the future, I would like to do more experiments and artistic practice with the film photography. I want to continue to explore the ex extension and creative scope of film photography learn more about the film manipulation and more intellectual and chemical ways of destroying and recreating the film photographs. Finally, I will be exposed to more new technologies such as 3D scanning and 3D modeling and will try to experiment more with the virtual photography. I would like to seek new approach to defining what photography is in a new field and use more innovative method of photography to exhibit a diverse array of artworks. So thank you for watching. This is my contact information. Thank you, Lynn. Oh, thank you very much. That was really great. Um, so thank now you. I want to remind people to feel free to use the chat um, as a way of making comments. Um, and now, okay, Susan. <laughs> um, well, uh, again, very impressive hard work that really um, shows both a connection to the outside world and all and also a connection to your own self and your own history and your own psyche. Um, the uh, I I had no idea that there were all these different versions of Chinese. Um, so that was quite amazing to, to see all the signs and labels on things and you, you change them in, uh, in Photoshop or something like that. Yeah, Photoshop. Yeah. Well, um, I find it quite interesting that you you focused on these language differences and other things like um, the CC cameras that you pointed out. And I thought, well, besides learning more myself about these signs that maybe are out there that I don't know how to read and they're in these different versions of Chinese, that's, that's an insight um, to a complexity that I wasn't aware of. Um, I was interested maybe to, to ask you why you were drawn to do that um, was it that in when you're in China, you see these all these different versions, or is it that the, the different versions of Chinese uh, stand out to you more in this country? Um, I'm I'm not. I feel like there is some bit of a connection between this first project. And your second project, which is seems uh, well, is more self uh, conscious. That is reviewing some kind of sounds like somewhat mysterious um, experience you had as a child. That is to say, like what, what here here as a good verse, good uh, image here, when a person is unaware that he or she is being violated, does he or she still suffer the same harm? It's like, uh, will they experience the same trauma? Well, that certainly 
maybe maybe a little bit says something about interpretation and maybe that brings back to the signage and the different languages like if you didn't know you were being violated if you didn't understand that um label or that um that type of communication uh an assault if you didn't experience it that way but later you were became aware that that was the meaning you didn't see the meaning of it at the time um so i i guess i see a little bit of a connection to the exploration of meaning that you do in your first project with the signage but i i um Chris uh, Johnson did send me some of the images that you showed in your second project. So I had seen them, be, but now obviously you, you're presenting a, a bigger presentation here with more detail. But I remember thinking when I was looking at some of the pictures that Chris sent was that each picture I had a different emotional reaction to. Some were very beautiful, like the hand, the two hands, the superimposed two hands. Yes, here, this one here on the left is so beautiful and elegant and uh, tender and seems affectionate in a, mo in a very tender kind of a way. It's not, doesn't feel like an assault of any sort. But then the picture that right that is right next to it is kind of frightening. So it's uh, in the viewer, me as a viewer anyway, that's my response, my reaction to that. And that puts the viewer into a kind of a, maybe an awareness that, that, a, that one image might be very beautiful of skin and hands and legs. And another image that also has hands and legs in it might be just plain kind of grotesque. Um, so each of these pictures in this second series of yours, I had these different emotional reactions to. And maybe again, a, a little bit goes back to the idea of interpretation of what is beautiful or and and this and communication also because like this picture with a portrait with hands in front of the face it's like this person is somehow trying to protect themselves but they haven't been able to completely protect themselves because we can see that face it's like um, and then this other one with the eye on on the on your back makes me think a little bit that you can see me that even that if i'm about to do something bad to you or something like that you you see me uh, uh, even though i'm behind you that you're aware of what's going on um let's see another can we can you show another one of from this series the so next Oh yeah, well, that's a funny one. Now this one, I guess I didn't quite catch what is going on with your arm up here. Uh, this is, I used uh, manipulate, I use uh, hot water to destroy the film. The oh. Is, yeah. So you did a, a little bit of, um, uh, of, of an attack. Yes. Um, so that, that's kind of stunning. I mean, I thought maybe it was, you had been burned. I thought this was a real burn scar or burn thing. Um, but again, it's like the other ones, there's an element of beauty contrasted with an element of sort of like this picture here on the left in particular, it, I can't figure out what it is, but it, it looks unappealing. 
Um, and the one on the right it is also a bit unappealing in a different way. Mysterious, though. They're both very mysterious. Let's see another one from this series, if we could. Sure. Oh, yeah. And this, well, the one on the right is very mysterious. Looks like we're in a cave or something. The one on the left reminds me a bit of the face with the hands over the face, but where you could see the face. In this case, there's both the hiding, the hidden um, protective hidden gesture. Um, but but this time it it feels not so beautiful. The picture, the other picture with the face and the hands was even though it portrayed to me a kind of fear and wanting to protect but it was also very beautiful this one is more painful like this is a real person in a corner because of something that's not good happening so I, i'm not quite sure I, I think I might have something more to say if I had took a little bit more time to study study it, but um, they're both very interesting bodies of work, um, and to some degree, perhaps there's a a link in, in the idea of of interpretation and communication. Uh, protecting and the meaning of things, like what is an assault? Um, sometimes we see birds in our backyards and, and, and they're flapping at each other and chasing each other around. I think, okay, they're either attacking each other or making love. I, <laughs> so there could be this interpretation of, of actions. But as you say, when a person gets older or at whatever point after a, a strange sexual physical encounter, how do they process it? Is it sort of more innate, more instinctive, instinctual to feel that you've been violated? Or does that feeling sometimes come with later on interpretations. I don't know, I'm kind of making this up. So thank you. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> you know, one of the things that that keeps recurring uh, in both of these bodies of work are contradictions, um, where on the surface, you, you might see a person who is clearly expressing fear and vulnerability, but obviously it takes a tremendous amount of courage <laughs> in order to, to be that honest. And, you know, in these examples, um, it always complicates easy readings of what it is that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that's where it gets its- Great. That's a good way of putting it. Complexity. The compl yeah. Complexity of the reason of, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, it's all right. Does anyone else want to comment before we move on? Hi, Elena, I just wanted to also, I left a comment in the chat, um, but I really love seeing the new work. I think I think you were able to take that experience and what you were working on in the fall and bring it together with some other work. And I think it makes it richer. Uh, and I think it's it's both easier kind of to enter and also, as Chris just said, also complicated. Uh, I also just want to compliment you on your presentation. I know that you work hard on presenting, and I think um, you sounded very articulate and and really made your thoughts clear about your process. And I think you did a really nice job. Thank you. 
I also want to chime in and just say that these um, these pairings are so wonderful. Um, there is this like really incredible sort of unsettling nature to the photographs, but the incongruity actually creates this other There's sort of magic and narrative um, for me. Yeah, so it's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nelson. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so now we get to move on to our next see how. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Zhao. Uh, I'm an analog photographer and now move to the introduction. I'm Zhao from Beijing, China, a, a photographer who loves film photography. My creative inspiration comes from the unique charm and rich texture brought by film photography. My photography style is uh, rooted in deep appreciation for the interplay of light, color, and composition. I believe that each photography should invoke a sense of wonder and curiosity, inventing the viewer to delve deeper and uncover the layers of meaning embedded with the image. By combining technical expertise with a keen artistic sensibility, I create images that are both visually striking and emotionally resistant. The subjects of my work are varied as life itself, encompassing cityscape, landscape, documentary, street photography, and more. I am drawn to the alternately and vulnerably of my subjects, and I aimed to uh, reveal their true essence throughout my photographies. Whether I'm capturing the filtering uh, expression of a street photography subject, the majesty beauty of nature landscape, or the powerful emotions of documentary project, my ultimate goal is creating a visual language that transcends culture and uh, linguistic barriers, connecting viewers on a deeply emotional level. Okay, and they are my uh, uh, inspired by Stephen Shore and uh, Anthem Adams. So I learned a lot from. Uh, those two artists, so they both like uh, master of the the large the large format. So the large uh, I still practice on the large format camera, and the large format gave me like more possibility and more sense during my like art creation. So when I like uh, practice the large format camera, I can know the like more possibility of the composition. And uh, I learned a lot from the Stephen Shore how to play the color. And I try to uh, bring two like master concept to my own artwork. Okay, now move to my alternate process. This is uh, a skill I learned this year and I really love this practice. Uh, so why I really love alternate process is uh, I have more, more like more possibility to recreate my own film negative and the same photos can create different feelings, different emotion on my on my photos. And as I labeled, so those photos called Sunset Collector and made with a one deck brown. So uh, I created those photos like recently this year. 
but like for so for the one deck brown the style is really like classic and vintage so it's so it makes Milver like hard to identity like which year those like those photos like came from and so you and this triptych make the so i really like play the negative space so i feel the cyanotype is like work work with the cyano oh uh, cyanotype can make the negative space like much like strong sense uh -huh. also this is a part of my like senior show project called like travel to the new york uh, so for this trip, it's really like significant for myself. So the the New York City is the first place I came to. I came to U.S. and also it's the first place I know. I know the America, and I live here for for three years. So I start photography like career as a hobby in. In New York City, and after and I moved to the San Francisco to learn the photography, and now I bring my like all knowledge and all my skill to back to the New York City and and shot those photos. Mm. <clears throat> Just give me one sec. Let me reshare the slideshow. Here is the, uh, so I print my boarding pass to like save the memory to the journey. And so all artwork happened during March 14th to March 22nd. <laughs> and this is a photo I shot during the, during the flight. So I make the so I make this project like have a uh, exactly the same order like I traveled. I want to bring more sense to audience like the audience itself. It's a uh, it's a uh, so it's like I take the audience like with me for the journey. <laughs> and so New York City is like always change, like the the people, the pricing, like like everything, the the street environment or the culture. And I I lived with my friend's home, and this is uh the photo I shot. And also like my friends, it's a main person in my journey, like during my uh, art careers. I also bring my, my bring my friends like hang out and looking around, and he kind of like enjoyed my journey, and like keep asking me about what's the difference between the, the West Coast and East Coast. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty good and nice conversation. So here is a. Uh, Another art project from last year, I called the number series. So the all art project showing the, the different numbers 
the different numbers in my artwork. And so, so for this art project, it's still in progress. So this is the, the number theory of the number eight. And oops. And this one is uh, oops. So this one is the uh, numbers of the nine. And uh, so for those numbers, it's matched uh, a powerful ticket like last year. So last year, after I took those photos, I purchased uh, exactly same same ordered like power powerball ticket, like include those numbers and I wish I can got the like the the price. And this is the number fifteen and nineteen. So I still working on for the this project. I want to continue to improve the number series, capture more meaningful numbers, which may be meaningful to myself or or family and friends. Uh, and secondly, continue to complete my mission, create visual narrative that delete into the complex of life and human experience throughout the lens of my camera. Uh, so like for the number series, like I want to take more meaningful photos, like, like, so for example, like the number six and the number eight, it's like, it's like good luck for the, so Chinese people like those numbers. I want to capture more like meaningful, uh, meaningful numbers in the photo for Chinese people. And also uh, I will do some research about like the, the culture shock. So the numbers like have meaning for, so numbers have different meaning for like different peoples. So I wanna like do more like diversity studies for the like add to the number series and for my two uh for my so i i inspired by two artists they both did the like like the like the traveling itself like with the car so i also plan on to drive from my hometown beijing to guangzhou uh the journey is about like four 1400 miles, I want to record the chance in different region of China and the different culture, environment, culture difference and deeper understanding of one's own cultures. So the journey maybe will take, so I plan spend a month for the journey. So more time give me uh, so more space to thinking about like how to create the the work and i can talk with the like the different place different place people and to know more information and more thought and bring it to my work and also the i will keep working on the alternate process so i really like the the handcraft process and <laughs> And so I can create different meaning and different like perspective and and also the large format brings me like different observation to my work. And here is my contact information. Thank you, Ziao. That was great. Uh -huh. Susan? <laughs> um, well, uh, I guess one of the things that strikes me is um, 
Yeah, keep going through. Would you show? Would you put up a proof sheet of this uh, show so that I can remind myself of the photos? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Good. Thank you. Um, well, I guess I love that photograph of the airplane wing. Oh my goodness, that's a beauty. That's a fabulous photograph. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, well, I guess one of the things that I might say strikes me is um, that you talked about the alternative processes, the Van Dyke and the cyanotype and having them feel like they're from a hundred years ago or yeah. more. Yeah. So um, it's hard to identities recently or from 90s, 80s or 70s. Or 1900. Yeah. Um, and, but you're also doing this traveling or you you foresee doing some traveling and you have done some traveling um, and you remarked on how New York has changed and every time you go back there you see different things or new things or how things are changed and you're recording your your own right at the moment um, views of buildings and a view of your friend and um and that all makes me think very much of being in the moment in the now in the 2023 now this is what you're doing and you're going to take us along with you but you also have this interest in somehow connecting to the past from 100 years ago um and I just find that quite interesting. And it would be interesting to see our modern world and yet be reminded of what pictures looked like a hundred years ago. Uh -huh. um, and and in fact, you're 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 doing it here. Um and the numbers thing, I was so interesting to hear that in your culture, there's various significant numbers. I guess there probably are in in the in the US in common culture, like I don't know. Yeah, like so I have the same feeling for that. So so for my own culture, so the Chinese people like number six or eight means like lucky or treasure. Uh -huh. and, and we don't like the number like with the four because the fourth number is like almost the same pronounced for the memory is like, like means the death or dying. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I like, so I already been US for a couple years. Mm -hmm. So I still remember like some like hospital, they don't have like, like, 13th floor like that well that's right they don't have this a lot of buildings don't have a 13th yeah. floor that's right uh-huh well i think that's very clever because you're putting up a number that has an emotional content to it because of the cultural uh symbolism um but then it is in a context here in the, with an American flag or with a California speed limit sign and a, and the you know I mean that looks so yeah uh, and and so the context here we are on the ground with spray painted marks on the ground it's kind of dirty um, and so whatever the meaning is of of the number nineteen gets overlaid with the idea of a dirty scruffy uh pavement does that make any sense yes were you are you thinking about that 
at all or, or I guess when you see a number it's going to be in some kind of context and so whatever that context is somehow relates to or is antagonistic to or is similar to the, the symbolic meaning of the number. Mm -hmm. So I was still like working on for this project and even it's the same number have different like meaning to like any individuals. So like, for example, maybe 19 for me, it's just a normal number. Maybe for other person, it's like, uh, maybe like for one of my friends. So he, uh, 19 maybe it's a, like a good, it's a lucky number for him. And maybe for my other friends, maybe like he or she will like dislike these numbers. So different viewers or audience will have different like thoughts. And the, if you had a 19 here, but then you found another 19 someplace else, uh, you know, like on a birthday cake or something like that, that would be a completely different. Yes. Yeah, feeling. Well, very interesting, now, very interesting the pairing of the, the numbers with a background that may or may not be coordinated in a sense. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you're thinking, of, you're not. So the, the pictures that you're doing with the alternative processes are seem to be fairly straightforward. Um, photos not with not numbers in them and things like that they're just they're, it's funny the romance of the idea of the nostalgic past is um very much present in in these pictures whereas the other pictures have more uh maybe more um, a thinking process, like what is this number, you know, and whatever reaction I have to that number, the symbolism of that number, and now it's in this context. I guess you could do the same thing and turn those into Van Dyke prints too. If, I don't know if that would be what you'd want, but very interesting, very interesting. I wish you the best. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Okay, thank you, Susan. Sure. So we have one more artist. Valencia. Hi. Okay. Last but not least. <laughs> okay. Actually, we start here. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Florencia Montefalcone and I am a multidisciplinary artist. I am graduating with a BFA in photography and textiles. Um, I started my path in San Francisco Art Institute and midway changed to CCA when the institute closed. So I was born in Buenos Aires in 1991. I'm the youngest of a family of four siblings. Um, and I was born into a, a kind of perfectionist um, family. And uh, since we we're so far apart, not far apart in age, um, I, I was very seen, I was very loved. And uh, I also became an observer of how um, social pressures and family pressures were exerted on my family. And also my mom had a master's thesis on self-esteem, right? So that ties into my interests. Um, so my work started, I, uh, I started, um, my first degree uh, was in fashion design, but I dropped out of that school because um, there was something that felt really off. I was always uh, very interested in uh, beauty and I absolutely loved beauty. It was actually my, my thesis theme of my high school art and projects. Um, and, and I felt really good that I, I knew how to portray beauty. So uh, when I started um, at SFAI, 
I started photographing and I was really interested in the female nude and the landscape and how this was my idea of beauty and I had never done it. So I started exploring what it took to make these images. And uh, I also like feminist awakening, reading Sarah Ahmed and reading all these feminist theories that I had not read before. I started discovering how, um, how absent the real experience of womanhood felt from these images. So in this body of work, really early body of work, um, in Tetas por el Monte, Magdalena and Sofia are comfortable on the shattered rocks. I wanted the installation to show kind of like the mechanisms that were happening for the images to occur. Mm -hmm. um, and it was being out there in the mountain nude and on shattered rocks was not comfortable. There was a sense of suffering, right? It felt empowering because being nude also felt like defying uh, the idea of what a nude body could and could not do or how it could or could not show be shown. Um, so it was it felt freeing, but at the same time, there was this this sort of like absence of what it takes to make beautiful images. Um, and like learning about the history of um, the depiction of women made from the male gaze. Um, so these were all the things that lived in my head to understand how I was evaluating beauty. Um, and I got really inspired by performance artists uh, from uh, the 60s, 70s, 90s, um, Valley Export, um, uh, welcoming everyone into uh, Valley Export on the left and uh, Janine and Tony on the right. Uh, artists who are using their bodies as objects and as makers and as subjects of the work, uh, putting themselves in the situations and uh, and uh, creating situations with their bodies. Um, I was very interested in that. And after being uh, um, out and about photographing my nude friends, I was interested in putting myself in there um, and seeing it, this as kind of both an exploration to understand how I was measuring myself with beauty standards and, that, and how I was able to read my images, the images of myself. Um, so this is one of my first like performances for the camera. It was very hard for me to see me in camera. Um, I did not like taking pictures of myself. Um, and uh, I first decided a Greco-Roman uh, sculptures of women back then. I had this idea of making a whole performance with like blood flowing out of like my crotch area for like a menstruating um, Greco-Roman statue. Uh, that never happened. Hopefully someday it will. But <laughs> those were like the things that I was thinking about, right? How absent the real experience of womanhood was um, in the images that I had been fed about beautiful women. Um, and uh, I started thinking also about the materials that I was using and the edits I was doing. So uh, this self-portraits, um, I decided to uh, pick all the images that had light leaks. This was a, a medium format camera and these were all the negatives that came out wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of perfection and beauty tied to the feminine experience. I started putting these prompts on myself about how I would make work to understand how they were making my hierarchies of value. Um, so I chose all the negatives that came out wrong and I printed them on butcher paper, which was the cheapest and shittiest paper I could find in school. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I didn't like the result. I hated it, but it was what I was showing, right? So that's what I was dealing with, with what do I like, what don't I like, and why do I like it? It became really overwhelming, and uh, this was the moment that COVID hit. So from, CC, from SFAI, I had to transfer into CCA. And uh, at CCA, I got the chance to acquire my second major in textiles. And uh, this kind of opened the gateway to making happy my little floppy, like my baby me. <laughs> uh, 
using colors and, and away from photography because I was feeling really overwhelmed with seeing myself in all, in all these images. I started actually painting on silk and it felt really good. There was a, a big sense of pleasure in this work um, uh, because of the colors that I was using, because I was also remembering how much I loved painting, but I always thought that I wasn't good enough. So I canceled painting and started photographing instead saying like, no, I'm not a good painter. I'm not a good drawer. I will never be good at this. And uh, coming to silk and being able to wear it, suddenly I felt like I had the authorization um, and that this these characters were actually worth seeing. And it was really fun to wear those pieces afterwards. So this one, Double Lucas Fantasy, I like started starting showing this one because Lucas is my partner, he's my husband. And uh, I've always been curious about how much he idolizes my body. Mm -hmm. um, he also idolizes me, but like my body is like something that he's always constant about. Like, yeah, my breasts, my, my body, whatever. And so I was like, well, what if he could have this body and idolize <laughs> himself with the body, right? Um, and well, the whole intricacy of gender performance and how men maybe don't feel that empowered with a female body. That kind of came up um, in sharing this work with him. Uh, and, uh, and well, Silk became the canvas in which I, uh, I felt really comfortable working. And uh, I then photographed all of these pieces um, on me. And uh, I decided to wear my grandmother's underwear for the documentation in a way to first feel safe wearing them because they're big and they're my grandmother's whom I dearly, dearly love. And, uh, and also because I was thinking of the whole lineage of women who had been um, part of my family, um, kind of like suffering the social constraints of uh, like gender um, or like the socially enforced gender expectations. Um, this piece is, um, is called Harry Nipples, Wife and Mom. And uh, I'm kind of thinking about the things that I don't accept about my, that, that I didn't accept about myself. Um, and one of those was hairy nipples. Um, and also like very confused about the term being like a wife and what it was gonna mean being a mom if I ever do become a mom. So like all these characters are drawn on book and uh, I so they kind of became um, talismans in a sense. It's kind of warm and soft and pleasurable to wear and to make. And it also helps me process all the questions that I had been doing through my photography. So uh, opening this new uh, way of making through textiles really gave me a sense of, of joy and the joy gave me confidence. Um, so I started photographing myself again, right? <laughs> um, and uh, after this work, I, uh, I, was, I was also looking at how I could translate. I was, I'm weaving as well, and I was looking at how I can translate images into garments. So I decided to photograph my bare chest and uh, weave a, a power vest of it. So. Uh, this garment, the boob power vest, I thought of it as uh, the garment to empower by showing the vulnerable. So it buckles in and it feels secure because it's tightening my waist, um, but it's also actually exposing um, my bare chest. Um, and then looking at ways of um, showing my textile work, I, I decided to um, photograph myself when I was trying to make uh, a DIY mannequin. And uh, this was the first time I was making it. And uh, um, the, the do-it-yourself mannequin it, it entails wrapping yourself on with packing tape, sticky side up, sticky side down, so it doesn't hurt. But um, the process of making it, I, I decided to photograph it um, thinking about the um, 
thinking that images would be cool. And they were definitely something like they revealed to me something um, like a good metaphor to think about um, the constraints that shape us and the ones that we're building on ourselves. So performance art in that way to me is definitely working as, um, as a healing way of making art and uh, also as a way of creating, also the camera is creating the images that then feed me the information of how I feel about the images of myself and how I am measuring myself with these images um, and understand them in the bigger context of images that exist in the world, right? Um, and it was a, it was a cool experiment. And then um, I got the chance to uh, uh, collaborate in a, in a piece that was ex it was exhibited at the Minnesota Street Project Atrium, and these are entities of the world, entidades del mundo, um, and uh, going a little bit further out, I uh, I think of ourselves as, as um, spiritual beings who are living a carnal experience. And uh, the show I was invited to participate is, in was about portals. And I was thinking of the body as a portal and the body as the enabler of our human experience. So uh, when, I'm, when I'm drawing on, on textiles, when I'm making these pieces, I'm not actually premeditating the drawings, but I'm like conjuring the spirits to come into the pieces, um, creating the this, this situation to put them in there. Uh, so this piece was born out of that. Um, and it also gave me the chance to see how my work could live outside of a body um, and hanging in space. Um, and currently, since I'm, uh, since I'm comfortable again photographing myself, um, I started photographing a live performance that I've been doing for, for a couple of years now that is about shaving only half of my body to understand how um, I feel with the unshaved half of my, the shaved and the unshaved half of my body um, and the way in which I can appreciate my body in those ways. So up to the left, you can see an image, a very early image I took of Lucas and myself um, on the bed and, and we can see the legs. I was always very amazed by how hairy his legs are and how shaved my, my legs are. Um, and the relation of the photography of, of a ha half hairy body. Um, I feel very vulnerable about this work. That's why I say that it's in progress because I've been thinking of the correlation between photography and weaving and, uh, and, and textile work in general for me um, and how comfortable I feel showing my textiles and how vulnerable and how I'm constantly negotiating how much of myself I show in my photo work. So uh, I started with this idea of thinking of my, my weavings or my textile work as a curtain, limiting the amount of visibility that the viewer has towards the images. So hiding behind the weaving are the images that I showed before. Um, and uh, the weaving in particular is a weaving that comes out of a lot of frustration because it's a very imperfect weaving. Everything I planned went wrong and I still went through it, um, trying to repair some mistakes, but still like not being able to repair them completely. So kind of like surrendering to the process and letting it be whatever it is. Um, and so in, a, in my approach to just weaving it as I could and what it allowed me to do, I ended up with this, um, with this very imperfect weaving and started thinking about how the long fringe is annoying to perfectionists, to my inner perfectionist, as the same way that my hairy leg can be annoying to the perfectionist in me that wants to be the exemplary um, woman. And so in this process of understanding my photography and my textile work as 
two sides of my own self, the self that is um, exuberant and enjoying life and very colorful and open about everything. And myself who is constantly um, negotiating how much I can show and how perfect these things about myself are. Um, I'm, I'm exploring the ideas of wrinkles and like how I, I think of my photo work as never enough and need have the urge to crumple it into a ball and throw it away and then like grab it again and stretch it and see like, okay, wait, I can appreciate something here. Why am I neglecting this image of myself so, so easily? Um, so this is where, where my head is right now um, in creating and putting things together. And what I'm looking for um, is for TC2, which is the Jacquard Loom uh, residency programs to uh, um, continue weaving images, thinking about the correlation of the structures that make the weavings appear with an image and the structures, the social structures that mediate and, uh, and make the way in which we um, perceive beauty, right? The hierarchies that perceive beauty. So, uh, okay, I don't know if it was too long, but thank you for listening. <laughs> and this is my contact information. Thank you so much. <laughs> Susan. Well, and once again, if you could just flip back through some yeah. of the pictures, particularly the first ones, because I'm my aging brain is not being able to. I love this prop. This this is amazing. This is a great one. I love this one, um, and it made me think of uh, so many different things. It made me think of. Um, that you're voluntarily encasing yourself, wrapping yourself up, but of course it's transparent, so we can't actually see you through the wrapping, even though you're all wrapped up. But then you escape from the wrapping and you peel off the wrapping. And then the last picture reminds me a little bit of occasionally when I've seen a rattlesnake skin, you know, mm -hmm. or the yes. skin of a <laughs> Yeah, and that, and so you've liberated yourself, and 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 you've disappeared. Um, <laughs> so that that's very, uh, is it's a very fun thing, uh, as well as having all the. And I love. Oh wait, stop! Yeah. The uh, the nipples with the eyes uh, that shirt. Oh, here, this oh one. my god, yeah. that's fabulous. I love that. I love the idea of the nipples being eyeballs. Yes. Yeah. So that came out of my idea. So I started drawing hairs around my nipples, oh, right? Thinking right. about you hairy nipples. That. And then I was like, well, they actually look like eyeballs. Oh, <laughs> I, like see, I see how that happened. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and then breasts became confrontational. Uh, they're not passive anymore. So yeah. in that confrontation, there's like the agency of breasts that were before like the vulnerable or like whatever right. needs to be covered up, right? They're not so passive now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a great design with this. I don't exactly get the design, but I think it's, I think you should market it right away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll weave more. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's let's see some more pictures. Remind myself. And and this is totally fun. Look at this oh, wonderful colors and lines and and your your funny posing with the underwear and everything. It's very cute. I mean, it's very. They remind me a little bit of um, Picasso's drawings. Mm. Oh. And I maybe I'm thinking of the ones with the, I think they're late. Are they late, those drawings with the Minotaur? The Minotaur? And uh, they're, they're, they're line drawings very similar to this. Not as funny, though, not as amusing. 
Well, it, it's great that you're having fun. You seem to be having fun with this. Yeah. Even the, even the wrapping up with a tape thing was kind of having fun. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, um, like I definitely felt a change of my approach to making um, uh, when I started working with different materials in my textile work. Mm -hmm. um, because the photo work was amazing, but it also felt very overwhelming, like very much into what I was allowed and not allowed to do and how I was either perpetrating what I didn't want to perpetrate or not. So there was like right. a very fine uh, or like a very fragile line that I was negotiating with my photo work and also feeling uncomfortable with doing all images of myself. That was like the prompt that I set to myself. Um, so it felt freeing to think right. about making something and then wearing it. So it becomes kind of like a talisman, yeah. um, safekeeping all of that spirit. Well, the, the image of you as the statue is very elegant, uh, but I can totally understand the um, discomfort. It's like you're trying to, or at least in my view, my take on it is that you're trying to actually become that, that sculpture. I love what you say here. Um, see how it feels to become a sculpture. I became blind, stiff, cold, and observed. Now that is not, it doesn't sound like a good feeling. Blind, <laughs> stiff, cold, and observed. <laughs> so, uh, and yet you're reenacting some kind of Greco-Roman um, idea of perfection, but but blind, stiff, cold, and observed, which it also is, is hardly what one would think of as being perfect. <laughs> and then you move toward having more fun with things. And here, yeah, this is such a surprise to go from the Greco-Roman sculpture to these guys. <laughs> what a what a shift yes it was definitely a big shift yeah well I think it's all quite um it seems uh quite unified but with an evolution you know it's it, it seems all of your work so far that we've seen here has to do with the body and particularly the female body but you've moved it along from an earlier version or earlier um mental attitudes to this later phase of letting it all hang out as people used to say yeah and actually thinking about the greco-roman sculpture it feels like uh, becoming blind, stiff, and observed is where I parted from um, mm -hmm. in this process, right? As a woman growing up in Argentina, and I think in many parts of the world, but um, Argentinian women are compared to uh, like the country's GDP. It's kind of <laughs> like you go to Argentina and you'll have amazing meat and amazing women. And when they're talking oh. about amazing women, they're not talking about how how intelligent yeah. or funny or smart or like how creative, creative. women are. It's about how they look. Yeah. And it's definitely um, how I was wired and how I grew up <laughs> yeah. having to look that way. And if you don't, then you have like less success and like less chances of being well, loved. You've, you've got that uphill battle of contradictions. Yeah. We have a visiting faculty from Textiles, Anne Wolf, who would like to make a comment, Anne? Yes, and um, thank you, Chris. Um, and um, I'm I'm sick today, so I, I can't talk long, but um, Florencia, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your presentation, and it was really exciting for me to see how all of your photography work and your textiles work come together and just seeing your presentation it makes so much sense to me um mm -hmm. this kind of back and forth between the two and why you need to keep going back and forth 
and I and there's this this seeking in that process of going back and forth for you and mm. almost like I don't even really care if you never find exactly what you're looking for but it's the movement through that seeking that is so interesting um and the so I have these separate thoughts so so one is that I wish for you just that you'll always continue to have that and not feel like obligated to choose one or the other um, because the two really are sort of speaking to one another and giving energy to one another and the other thing that I find so fascinating is um, just like for us textiles people like there's this language of physicality in textiles of embodiment and in the beginning of your presentation I thought that um you there was like this need to go to textiles to have some of those physical embodied experiences in the work that photography doesn't have and then at the end with that that the textile itself became a way of hiding the embodiment or you know that curtain that you flipped it and it you know it it's it was disorienting that um the way that you did that so anyways it was kind of delightfully disorienting um so i i just wish for you that you continue this this searching and um movement through um the back and forth and all of these um questions and media congratulations thank you so much and I really appreciate that. And yes, the disorientation, I am learning that is the orientation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Become comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's that was a conversation I had with Aspen a couple of weeks ago. And and it and that's the place where where I feel like I'm doing meaningful work. Yes. And then even like seeing like the photo paper wrinkled and the photo paper yeah became the textile and the textile became the you know like um, yeah, was, like yeah. toward that yeah on the left and I mean that looks like it could almost be fabric but um but I mean paper is also a fiber like based material um so like that was just really cool thank you I'm thinking about weaving these wrinkles <laughs> into the TC2, seeing how that would translate. Well, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you so much to our brave and talented photographers and artists. Um, and uh, just, just to remind people that next week is the opening of the Fine Arts Senior Exhibition um, at SOMART. Um, so we get a chance to see a lot of this work in person. Um, and uh, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you all for all this incredible work, mental, emotional, technical, uh, aesthetic efforts, so much thinking and processing and development of your ideas and growth it's just so impressive wonderful yeah it's great fun well thank you everybody any last words okay thank you everyone for being here it's um i was really nervous to do this and i thought i was going to go over time so badly so <laughs> thank you no, well, this thanks was nice. everyone you did so well yeah. And uh, don't forget, uh, we have uh, the second class um, as well coming up on the 26th. And our respondent is uh, Shana Lopes, uh, assistant professor, uh, associate, uh, no, sorry, assistant curator at SFMOMA. So um, see y'all there. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you.